Greetings to the audience. Uh, my name is Juzer Ali. I am professor of medicine in the section of pulmonary critical care at the LSU Health Sciences Center School of Medicine in New Orleans. The incidence and uh, prevalence of uh, this disease is uh, uh, not clearly known because in certain countries and states, uh, it's not a reportable disease. Uh, so the data is most of the time either based on uh, uh, insurance uh, data or sometimes based on lab prevalence. As you can see on this slide, overall, it is uh, fairly uh, clear that when we look at the global distribution of respiratory uh, NTM isolates, they are all across the world. They are not limited to Europe, North Africa, uh, North America, or, uh, or, or uh, Australia uh, and Japan, but they are now uh, being recognized in Asia, in the Far East, in Africa. Of the NTM, uh, the, the prevalence and incidence, again, depending on who is reporting it and in which uh, database, uh, Mycobacterium avium uh, is the most common uh, mycobacteria that we see. As far as the distribution of this disease process and infection amongst uh, various population and subsets, women appear to uh, uh, have a disproportionate burden of NTM lung disease. And this is especially with the physical correlates of the bronchiectatic nodular uh, type of uh, NTM and MAC infection. Uh, there is a very uh, distinct link between bronchiectasis and NTM LD. And uh, um, although uh, both of them overlap, it's not really clear as to the cause and effect relationship. Um, the debate constantly is that NTM infection may exacerbate bronchiectasis and bronchiectasis begets bronchiectasis characterized by the definition of bronchiectasis, which is the permanent bronchial dilatation secondary to chronic inflammation and infection. Uh, the pathophysiology that we see in bronchiectasis is essentially uh, what we see in the mycobacterial uh, lung disease. The clinical presentations of uh, uh, bronchiectasis pure versus the one associated with NTM uh, essentially is, uh, is the same, and it is very difficult to separate it until and unless we do uh, appropriate cultures and follow them with a microbiological confirmation. Uh, at the same time, the comorbidities that are associated with bronchiectasis, such as sinus infections, reflux uh, disease, etc., may exaggerate the presentation and exacerbate the acute infection that goes on. So associated NTM infection, such as uh, Mycobacterium gordoni and Mycobacterium abscessus coming from the GI tract is a well-known uh, clinical entity that we see. And as far as follow-up is concerned, the uh, NTM lung disease needs to be followed up by um, uh, its mycobacterial cultures, but at the same time, the severity of the disease can be seen radiographically, and that is by monitoring the bronchiectasis severity index scores, which is not only a comprehensive clinical assessment of how the disease is progressing, but also um, uh, takes into account radiographic and pulmonary function features. Pulmonary comorbidities are very important to keep in mind when we are dealing with NTMLD. The way I look at it is NTMLD is essentially a tip of the iceberg. Under the surface of the iceberg, we have the pathophysiology of bronchiectasis, which we have already talked about. Under that surface are the pulmonary comorbidities. These comorbidities may be associated with the bronchiectasis itself or may be independent of that with a different uh, uh, anatomical disfigurement such as cavitation. 
The common comorbidities that we see with NTMLD are COPD, asthma, lung cancer, pulmonary fibrosis, to name a few. At times, uh, other immune deficiencies may cause other comorbidities, along with, um, in certain geographical areas, uh, sarcoidosis. So it is important to keep in mind that whenever we are dealing with non-tuberculous uh, lung infection, mycobacterial lung infection, whereas it is important to keep that in mind, it is equally important to keep the what is under the surface, which is the pulmonary comorbidities. COPD with or without bronchiectasis is known to have a worse prognosis and a more severe management course than it would be without the two diseases itself. Similarly, asthma is associated with NTMLD and is identified in about 1.7% uh, of patients. So there is an eosinophilic component to a disease, and this is important in our management because the use of inhaled corticosteroids for asthma may not be a very good thing for those patients that have both the diseases. Moving along, the radiographic features of uh, NTM lung disease may mimic lung cancer. So that's an important consideration. And there is a lot of data to show that these two diseases with associated lung cancer and NTM um, have now been uh, published uh, uh, in, the, in the literature in the form of case series and case reports. The sarcoidosis association of mycobacterial lung disease and sarcoidosis is well recognized although not very well understood as to how it is linked. Uh, of course, tuberculosis and mycobacterial lung disease uh, with NTM, they are almost identical in their clinical presentation. And the only way to separate that would be with the mycobacterial cultures. So the only way to differentiate, to recognize this particular infection is by respiratory secretion and sputum collection. Sputum collection is a very important, but yet mostly um, uh, done in a casual manner, unfortunately. As I keep saying to my medical students sometimes, sputum is as sputum is, and sputum is as good as the sputum that is given. So collection of sputum and uh, an awareness of why we are doing it is critical. First of all, the airway clearance that we do for bronchiectasis serves a dual purpose. It is not only therapeutic for airway clearance, whatever measures we use, but it is also to, uh, to uh, obtain the most valid uh, sputum collection that we can do that can give us the best diagnostic results. It is said that sputum uh, collection essentially is the key to the diagnosis and the management and that the specimens must be in a form in which the lab can give us the best answer. Confirmation of two sputum cultures is also an important indicator of NTM LD infection. And at the same time, monthly sputum evaluation, uh, ideally speaking, would help us to know whether the treatment for NTM LD is successful. We should not forget that the clinical and radiographic criteria for NTM LD mimics many other lung diseases, especially other mycobacterial infections and, uh, and uh, especially TB. And therefore, in this case, the specificity that the sputum collection gives to determine the type of infection, the species of infection is very critical. This radiographic assessment is crucial. In fact, this represents the partnership that we need to have in our management of NTM LD. The partnership that we have is with pulmonary infectious disease, respiratory therapist, and radiologists. And bronchiectasis, which is seen especially with MAC infection, 
can be multifocal and in, in various presentations. As you can see on this slide, you have the tubular bronchiectasis with some lean uh, mucus pluggings. We have some bronchiolitis changes with tree and bud uh, uh, formation. We have the cystic, uh, rounded cystic, typical bronchiectasis that we can see in any infection. And then we have the non-descript, non-specific nodularity. These features of bronchiectasis with MAC infection are not only very common, but they are important to follow. And therefore, radiographic assessment to the degree of how um, various lobes are involved, which segments are involved, and the degree of uh, the cystic bronchiectasis converting into cavities is an important part in the radiographic assessment. We also have cavitary lung disease in NTMLD. And, in, and, and especially when we, we see this diagram, uh, this uh, CT scan over here with large cavities on the right side, it will be very difficult to differentiate this from any other necrotizing infection or any other necrotizing granulomatous mycobacterial disease. And for that matter, from any fungal disease. But the, the sputum collection, the respiratory secretion collection, the right demographics of the patient along with this cavitary disease uh, will make us suspect uh, NTM LD or NTM MAC. Hello, I'm Dorina Drizzo Harris. I'm a professor of medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, NYU Langone Health here in New York City. I am uh, the director of our NYU NTM and Bronchiectasis Center here. The new guidelines, which came out in July of 2020, uh, discussed uh, the factors that should be considered in making a decision about starting antimicrobial therapy. Um, the guidelines actually weigh on the side of treating patients with NTM uh, lung disease, but we know that there are also patients who may, on their own, convert their sputums. So the decision to initiate antimicrobial therapy uh, should be individualized uh, with the patient's um, input. Um, as to uh, the side effect profiles that may occur um, and the length of treatment. Um, the clinical factors to consider that we know um, have uh, affected whether or not someone should be treated would be things such as the virulence of the organism. We're much more likely to treat um, Mycobacterium abscessus right away, and we may in, uh, want to uh, watch someone with Mycobacterium avium complex, which usually progresses more slowly. Uh, we might um, want to start treatment immediately on someone who has macrolide resistant a mycobacterium avium complex, and we will talk about that more later um, in this broadcast. So the virulence of the organism is extremely important in making that decision. And then there are many individual patient priorities that we're going to want to think about. We want to think about the comorbidities that the patient may have, other pre-existing lung disease, uh, if they're on any immunosuppressive agents or if they are have an acquired immunodeficiency. We may also want to take into consideration um, other drug th drugs that may interact with the regimen that we, we would want to give them. We will obviously look at their CAT scan, their pulmonary function test, and their symptoms, and we may decide to watch someone, watch them very cautiously um, if we're not going to treat them. If they have mild disease, um, if someone has a rapidly progressive CT, or if they have significant symptoms of cough and sputum and fevers that are disrupting their daily life, um, that's an easy question. We'll start those patients on therapy right up front. Um, some of the other things that may push us to treating, uh, because we know that they lead to uh, uh, poor prognosis is cavitary disease, uh, and we would treat patients who have uh, malnutrition, uh, low body mass index, uh, and someone who has elevated inflammatory markers might 
um, be, might have a poor a progression compared to someone who does not. Yes, um, the new guidelines um, um, recommend drug susceptibility testing for NTM lung disease. Uh, they discuss uh, testing for um, mycobacterium avium complex uh, and also discuss um, mycobacterium cancassi and uh, mycobacterium abscessus. So uh, the recommendation is to perform drug susceptibility testing for broth mycobacterium uh, by broth microdilution. Uh, and the important thing uh, to know is that um, for mycobacterium avium complex, the two drugs that you're going to really want to focus on um, are uh, your macrolide. Uh, we usually use clarithromycin um, in the lab to do in vitro testing, and that correlates very well with its in, vit in vivo susceptibility. Uh, so a cut point of greater than or equal to 32 would make your macrolide resistant. And in those patients, we know they have a much poorer prognosis. Um, you would also want to look at amikacin, and there are two different cut points for parenteral amikacin. It's greater than um, 64 greater than or equal to 64, and for um, inhaled uh, liposomal amikacin, the uh, MIC is greater than or 128, that would make that patient resistant. So very important in knowing that when you're choosing your regimen, uh, and uh, we certainly recommend it strongly in anyone who has uh, relapsed or is progressing on therapy. From Mycobacterium cancassi, you're going to want to get a rifampin and a clarithromycin resistant. Rifampin's MIC of greater than two would imply that rifampin is resistant. And for mycobacterium abscessus, we would want again to focus on macrolides and amikacin as we do for mycobacterium avium complex. Clofazamine is a drug that we use for mycobacterium abscessus, and that shows very good in vitro activity, acts synergistically with amikacin and uh, the macrolides, and often prevents the emergence of amikacin-resistant um, M. abscessus uh, in vitro. So we correlate that and often use clofazamine in our mycobacterium abscessus regimen. So there are several uh, treatment options when you have a patient who has macrolide susceptible MAC. Now, when you first diagnose them and get positive cultures back, you won't yet have um, your sensitivity panel. So we assume everyone is macrolide susceptible one, when we first initiate treatment while we're waiting for the susceptibility test to come back, and that can be several weeks. And then, of course, if it comes back resistant to amikacin or uh, macrolide, we will then uh, change our therapy. But for someone who is macrolide susceptible and has nodular bronchiectasis, the regimen is a three-drug regimen, which includes a macrolide as the primary drug. Um, and that is recommended uh, to be given three times a week for at least 12 months after culture conversion. And that's non-cavitary nodular bronchiectasis. For those patients who have cavitary disease, we then recommend uh, daily macrolide-based regimen for um, at least 12 months after culture conversion. The standard regimen um, is a macrolide. Azithromycin is preferred and recommended in the guideline, along with a thambutol, and then a rifamycin. Rifampin is the preferred rifamycin. And in patients with severe cavitary disease, and I may even say even initial cavitary disease, or very advanced severe bronchiectasis, we will add IV uh, amikacin or streptomycin uh, at the beginning of the initial treatment and usually do that for several months. This is also recommended in patients who have macrolide-resistant MAC. So uh, patients with refractory MAC, and let me give you that definition first, it's defined as remaining sputum culture positive after six months of being on a guideline-based therapy. And as I said, a guideline-based therapy is three drugs, either three times a week or daily, depending on your, um, your um, uh, amount of disease. Um, 
It has not yet been proven that two drug therapy is sufficient. There is a large trial ongoing currently um, looking at two drug therapy versus three drug therapy. But right now, two th- drug therapy is not considered um, a recommended treatment. So in a patient who is still positive at six months, we are going to sig- seriously consider adding inhaled um uh, liposomal amikacin or ALICE, amikacin liposome in, inhalation su- suspension. Uh, that became FDA approved in the fall of 2018, and it is the only um, placebo controlled uh, prospective trial looking at patients who have ha- had ALICE added to their regimen compared to basic guideline based treatment. And there was a, a 30% conversion rate in that group compared to 9% in the guideline-based treatment group. So you would want to add that to uh, to the regimen and then hope for a conversion of sputums, and then you would continue therapy uh, for an additional 12 months. You can also add IV amikacin in the appropriate setting for several months to assist patients to convert. And then there are some additional therapies that we might consider, such as adding uh, clofazamine to a regimen um, uh, or bedaquiline, which is an off-label use uh, for um, patients who have a fr- refractory MAC disease. So there are several non-MAC um, NTMLD that are discussed in the guidelines. Uh, M. consacii is the first. Uh, that can be treated either with daily or three times a week therapy with rifampin, ethambutol, and azithromycin. You would want to consider the comorbidities of your patient and the amount of disease on CT when choosing a daily or three time a week regimen. You can also substitute isoniazid for azithromycin uh, and do that uh, in a daily fashion. Uh, and if you have have any trouble with any of these medications, you can substitute a fluoroquinolone in one of the regimens, uh, usually moxifloxacin. For m um, you have a choice between a daily or a three-time-a-week regimen. In the daily, you're using three drugs, rifampin, ethambutol, and either a macrolide or fluoroquinolone. Um, if you're doing the three-time-a-week regimen, then you would be on four drugs, and the additional drug would be IV amikacin. So rifampin, ethambutol, IV amikacin, and either a macrolide and a fluoroquinolone. For m which is often the most complex, um, we want to think about doing an initial phase and then a continuation phase. Uh, there are three sp- subspecies of M. abscessus, M. abscessus abscessus, M. abscessus boletii, M. abscessus maciliense, and they each have different uh, variations of acquired or um, mutational macrolide resistance. So it's extremely important to find out if your patient has a macrolide resistant species. Um, because if you do not have azithromycin in your regimen, then you will need to use uh, two to three IV antibiotics. Mostly recommended are amikacin, imipenem, or cefoxidin, and a tigacycline. And then we will add oral meds, uh, azithromycin, if uh, they're sensitive, uh, and the other options that we have as per the guideline, clofazamine or linazolid. In the continuation phase, we would consider Uh, having them on at least three drugs. If they're not sensitive to azithromycin, then clofazamine, linazolid, and inhaled amikacin would be a very nice regimen, and you could use Alice in this this case. Um, And um, azithromycin uh, might be added if you're using it as an anti-inflammatory property for patients who have frequent exacerbations of their bronchiectasis. But in any of these cases, uh, it's extremely important uh, to um, get expert consultation because these can be uh, very complex patients to treat. Hi, I'm Dr. Kevin Winthrop. I'm a professor of infectious diseases and public health here at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon, USA. More and more data is coming from the real world space the last five to 10 years to help us understand how patients are being treated for pulmonary NTM or NTM lung disease. Um, And to help us understand the tolerability and the maintenance of the regimens. Most recently, a colleague of mine, Jennifer Koo, 
presented work uh, looking at Medicare data in the United States showing that approximately half the patients who start regimens against pulmonary MAC have either changed or uh, discontinued those regimens by six months. And in fact, by 12 months, uh, no matter what regimen they started, uh, it, was, it was more like 80 to 90 percent of patients had either changed or discontinued the regimen. We don't know why. We think probably many of these changes are due to tolerability issues and adverse events. And this, of course, deserves further research and inquiry. And that, that is the next steps uh, of our project. Um, other single center and population-based studies have also uh, spoken to this. A study we did um, a number of years ago, four or five years ago, looking at linezolid tolerability and the treatment of MAC and mycobacterium abscessus showed uh, almost 90% of patients discontinued linezolid at some point due to uh, an attributable adverse event uh, with a median of 20 weeks. So uh, linezolid is often a drug that if I am using it, I know that it probably has a limited time span for its use due to uh, rate limiting adverse events. Um, lastly, I'll highlight an observational retrospective study of patients from a regional TB reference center uh, in the treatment of NTM lung disease uh, with um, about a third of the patients more suffering AEs uh, in, in follow-up due to the regimens with also a high rate of dis treatment discontinuation. So clearly, adverse events are something we need to understand more about. We need to monitor for them and we need better ways to prevent them. Well, any uh, start of therapy is preceded by a discussion of uh, potential benefits and risks, you know, the pros and cons of starting these various therapies. For, for the most part, I would say that our standard management of pulmonary MAC or mycobacterium even complex disease is fairly straightforward. There's really only four or five drugs we typically use. Uh, and for the most part, most people seem to tolerate uh, these drugs. Um, there are... Uh, individual side effects that may occur is typically with one of the drugs out of the three that we start with. And we often have to shift stuff around or, or experiment in terms of how we give the meds to see if we can uh, make those adverse events more tolerable. Uh, some of the more important adverse events to discuss with the patient prior to start uh, have to do with, you know, more serious events. And certainly, um, I would highlight a couple here. I mean, our usual starting regimen, azithromycin, Thambitol and rifampin. Um, azithromycin is, is a very well tolerated drug, but long term can be associated with hearing loss and tinnitus. Uh, there are issues theoretically around a prolonged QT interval that occur with that drug, but really only if, if multiple QT prolongating drugs are being used together. At that point, we may choose to monitor someone, but generally speaking, EKG monitoring is not necessary uh, with the use of amacolide alone. Um, in the absence of other um, QT prolongating agents. Um, ethambitol, very important to discuss with your patient the issue of potential vision loss. It can cause, um, you know, inflammation of the optic nerve. The risk of this is probably age-related and it's dose-related. Um, some of the other important side effects uh, to discuss around rifampin or rifabutin, any rifamycin, uh, the main issue there is drug-drug interactions, and it's very important to look through uh, the patient's medications that they take for other um, issues such as uh, hypertension and hyperlipidemia, uh, and to look at drug-drug interactions and to manage those up front uh, should they be an issue. Um, other things to consider are inhaled antibiotics like inhaled um, amikacin, both liposomal amikacin as well as generic amikacin. Um, or any other inhaled antibiotic. Occasionally, we're using inhaled tobramycin, depending on the organism. Uh, but these agents can irritate um, the airway. They can cause increased cough, increased sputum, or dysphonia um, occasionally. So uh, these are, as a quick overview of, of some of the potential adverse reactions you need to discuss with your patient prior to um, starting therapy. I would say, our, in general, patients on these therapies need to be um, to be evaluated in various ways every two to three months, and uh, we certainly check laboratories on um, anyone on a multi-drug regimen uh, again every two to three months. Uh, 
and those include CBCs and comprehensive chemistries. Uh, if patients are on uh, rifampins or rifamycins, I should say, um, and they take thyroid replacement, it would also include evaluation of a, a TSH to make sure their, uh, their thyroid replacement hasn't been harmed by the rifamycin. Um, you know, questions around macrolide uh, therapy in terms of monitoring hearing. I think there's data to support monitoring hearing. I, I do think it's something that occurs with really long-term use. Uh, many of my colleagues don't routinely monitor hearing, uh, and I would say that, that we only do so at our center in, in certain individuals, but that would be something to, to consider. GI side effects, you know, certain, um, certain issues about what time of day you take your medicine. Do you take it with food or on an empty stomach? I would say in general, uh, we don't recommend taking any of these meds on an empty stomach. My experience would be that, that patients tolerate them better uh, if, if they have some food in their belly. Um, and then, again, in terms of uh, vision testing, you know, I'd say this is, um, it's, it's all over the board. Some people uh, screen patients' vision uh, on a Q2 or three-month basis. Um, some patients are given at-home screening tools, either Snell and eye charts or color vision uh, Ishihara plates. Uh, we, we test color vision when they come in the office every two to three months during their follow-up visits. Uh, there are some people you might want to wish, uh, you wish you might want to screen more closely in collaboration with an ophthalmologist, you know, patients that have existing uh, optic nerve disorders or glaucoma. Those are the people that um, I usually collaborate with an ophthalmologist uh, and have them uh, be seen on a regular basis, maybe every three months or every six months uh, to have visual field testing and, and other um, evaluations. So liposomal inhaled amikacin is a, is a relatively new therapy. It was approved several years ago for the treatment of refractory uh, pulmonary MAC. It's now under study for the treatment of um, you know, treatment-naive MAC, so, so we're looking at using it earlier in therapy. In terms of its tolerability profile, uh, about a quarter of the patients in the phase two trials could not you know, tolerate the drug. Uh, they, they did discontinue um, due to tolerability issues. And I would say that experience matches uh, mine in the real world, where about half the patients seem to have no, no uh, tolerability issues whatsoever, and then the other half do. And among that half, about half will eventually discontinue. Uh, most of the adverse event profile of this drug is, is similar to any other inhalational antibiotic in terms of um, whenever you're inhaling anything, uh, it can increase airway responsiveness, cough, um, sputum production, um, bronchospasm, and actually dysphonia or, or hoarseness. And that, that is the latter is the most common uh, thing that we saw with Alice in, in our open label extension uh, where we studied these, these issues. I think most importantly in that open label extension, you know, audiograms were evaluated and we didn't see any decrease in hearing associated with this drug. We did see a slight increased risk of tinnitus, and I do talk about that with patients, uh, particularly if they have existing tinnitus, um, it potentially could, could get worse. Um, but again, it was, it, was, it was a small percent of patients. So most of the management around this drug has to do with improving airway tolerability. Um, we often give patients a uh, bronchodilator prior to using it. Um, this helps diminish the airway spasm and might help diminish cough associated with it. Um, we have patients gargle uh, with salt water after using it. Uh, in my head, I think that probably helps um, diminish the hoarseness that might occur. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, a lot of patients just simply get, get used to it. Their airway gets used to this drug, just like other inhalational therapies with time. So, I often start uh, with an intermittent regimen for the first month uh, and gradually build patients up uh, to a daily regimen uh, as they are tolerating the drug or improving the tolerability of the drug. When you're thinking of non-MAC uh, lung disease, primarily in the U.S. and actually worldwide, probably the second most common would be mycobacterium abscessus. Um, and that, that's the one that's the most difficult to treat in terms of having to rely on uh, parenteral uh, multi-drug regimens and very close monitoring associated with the use of those regimens. So usually we're using uh, an aminoglycoside, usually amicacin. 
And then oftentimes we're using either imipenem or tigacycline or now uh, to some extent omatocycline. And, you know, all these therapies have different side effects. Certainly with immunoglycosides, you're worried about hearing and uh, renal side effects. So monthly audiograms are, are very important. And Q2 week um, CBC and comprehensive chemistry monitoring are, are also necessary. Some drugs like tigacycline can be associated with quite a bit of uh, GI upset, nausea, vomiting. We often pre-treat um, individuals using that drug with um, an anti-emetic uh, an hour before using it. Uh, and that can be true of other drugs as well. Um, if nausea is a is an issue with your regimen, then pre-treating with an anti-emetic is always a good idea uh, to try. Um, mycobacterium kansasii would be another common non-MAC lung disease to, to treat. Uh, this is the only NTM that really responds to uh, TB treatment. Um, uh, Isoniza, dethambital, and rifampin, which are, of course, uh, three of our big four for, for standard TB therapy. Uh, and I've mentioned some of the side effects before. Um, you know, thinking about visual monitoring with the thamatol, certainly educating the patient to, to report any vision change so you can at least discuss it or test them. Um, and then the drug-drug interactions around rifampin and then, of course, um, liver chemistry monitoring with uh, isoniazid or INH. Uh, mycobacterium zinopi, uh, very similar, also rifampin and thamatol. Uh, sometimes the fluoroquinolone is involved um, in, the, in the treatment of that organism. Same monitoring that we've talked about so far, although fluoroquinolones do carry some, um, you know, some specific adverse events, you know, in, including, you know, musculoskeletal toxicity uh, and tendinopathy. Uh, if these things occur, then uh, considering stopping the drug uh, or in some cases you decrease the dose of the drug. Um, and, and there's other things we can we can think about sometimes too. Sometimes you don't know which drug's doing it, and you have to just stop all the drugs and reintroduce them one by one, a week at a time, to isolate which drug is causing the toxicity.